Hi there, everybody. Hi from Toronto, where it's evening. I'm not sure where in the country you're from, but welcome to the 2022 uh, Giller Book Club. My name is Daphna Rabinovich, and I am thrilled to welcome uh, you to our fifth book club this year. Please make sure to have your Zoom on a side-by-side -side view for the best possible experience. And it is my profound pleasure to introduce you to our interviewer tonight, author and person extraordinaire, Catherine Hernandez. Catherine is a proud queer woman of color and an award-winning author. Just wait till I actually fully talk about um, her bio because it's really quite extraordinary. She is of Filipino, Spanish, Chinese, and Indian heritage, and she is married into the Navajo Nation. Her first novel, Scarborough, won the Chim Wong Chu Award for the unpublished manuscript, was a finalist for the Toronto Book Awards, the Evergreen Forest of Reading Award, the Edmund White Award, and the Trillium Book Award, and is now a finalist for Canada Reads 2022. Yes, I know, it's so exciting. She has written the critically acclaimed plays Sing Pill, the Fan Playlist, and Eating with Lola, and the children's book books, M is for Mustache, a Pride ABC book, and I Promise. She recently wrote the screenplay for the film adaptation of Scarborough, produced by Copy Films and Level Films, and which premiered at the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival. It was the first runner-up for the coveted People's Choice Award, won the Sean Mendes Foundation Changemaker Award, was nominated for 11, I repeat, 11 uh, Canadian Screen Awards, including Best Picture and Best Adapted Screenplay, and won the Panavision Spirit Award for Independent Cinema at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival. I could go on and on and on because her work has won so many awards. She's, you know, voiced books for audiobook for Audible, and just it. Your your bio is tremendous, Catherine. Let me just say that she is currently working on her third novel, PSW, which is going to be published in 2023 by Harper Collins. And tonight, Catherine will be interviewing Katerina Vermet author of the novel, The Strange, The Strangers, long listed for the 2021 Scotiabank Giller Prize. Please feel free to submit your questions at the bottom using the Q&A button. And I hand it over to you, Catherine. <laughs> thank you so much. What a, <laughs> thank you for that introduction. Um, you know, it's, it's always a little unnerving when um, people read uh, your bios and you just sort of, sort of have to sit there in a live situation and it's even more uncomfortable in a Zoom situation. And now it is uh, Katarina's uh, turn to feel really uncomfortable while I read her bio. So are you ready? Are you ready, Katarina? I'm, um, I'm ready. So ready. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were always talking about that, like about like, what kind of faces do you make <laughs> during these events, right? Because now it's all your face, you know, uh, in live really? events, at least people can sort of be distracted by other noises and everything. It's not just about you, but now it's all about us it's and just, our backgrounds. And our backgrounds, our judgy backgrounds. Hey, I got some I got some art today, so. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah, 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 that's wall. great. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. Okay, so uh, let me read this astounding person's bio because it is unbelievable. Um, and uh, I'm so honored to share space with you today. Uh, so Katerina Vermet, uh, she, her, hers is a Red River Métis Michif writer from Treaty One territory, the heart of the Métis nation. She has worked in poetry, novels, children's literature, and film. Born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, her father's roots run deep in St. Boniface, St. Norbert, and beyond. Her mother's side is Mennonite from the Altona and Rosenfield, uh, Rosenfeld area Treaty 1. Vermette received the Governor General's Literary Award for Poetry for her first book, North End Love Songs. The Muses Company, The Break, which is published by House of Anansi, won several awards, including the Amazon.ca First Novel Award and was a bestseller in Canada. 
her National Film Board documentary, This River, won the Canadian Screen Award for Best Short. She holds a Master of Fine Arts from the University of British Columbia. Her second novel, The Strangers, which is this brilliant piece of fiction here, won the Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction, um, a fiction Prize Award, uh, uh, sorry, Atwood Gibson Writers Trust Fiction oh Prize, and was named Chapters Indigo's Book of the Year 2021. It was also long listed for the Giller Prize. Katerina lives with her family in a cranky old house within skipping distance of the temperamental Red River. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, can you do us the honors of please giving us a reading of this beautiful book? For sure, I'm happy to do that. Um, I first want to acknowledge my, oh, there's my big face right over. Um, I first want to acknowledge my territory in this blessed place I am honored to be on. I am in Treaty One right now, homeland of the Métis Nation also known as Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And the Red River, yes, is indeed just about six houses down behind me. I like to honor both of the land and the water in this place that literally gives me home and keeps me alive. So I'm gonna read from The Strangers. Um, I'm gonna read from Cedar's chapter. <clears throat> so this is from the point of view, very little setup is needed. It's from the point of view of a young girl. She's about 14 at the time. And this is when she meets her father um, for the first time in her memory um, and her stepmother. They seem nice enough at the start. They're still nice, just different. I met them at the social work office downtown a few weeks after my mom told me what was happening. It was still summer, still hot, and I still had the same respite worker. I thought mama would be at the meeting too, but she wasn't and no one mentioned it, so I didn't ask. They just took me to the big room with the TV and the couch. It somehow looked really run down from the last time I was there, like the furniture needed a wash. I felt embarrassed by all of it. They were in there waiting for me. A young looking, dark haired, put together man. The only gray on the side of his face made me think he was older. And a nice looking blonde lady with shiny gold rings, earrings and necklace, Sean and Nikki. Nikki stuck out her hand when she was introduced, then pulled it back and blushed like girls do in the movies. The social worker did most of the talking at first. Cedar's going into grade nine, high school. Isn't that right, Cedar? I only nodded. Didn't look up not much. My dad, Sean, smiled whenever I did it, and I was shy. And your daughter is about a year older? The lady, Nikki, piped in. Yes, almost exactly. She's going to be 15. Her birthday is just a few weeks after hers, yours. She turned to me. We can celebrate together if you want. She had deep blue eyes, almost a gray. And when she smiled, the lines around them twisted. Her makeup glittered under the yellow lights and she even wore lipstick. I could see the line around her lips and it didn't smudge at all. And they have a room for you in their house, the social worker continued as if she was trying to convince me of something like I had a say. It's just a bed and a dress and a desk right now, Nikki said. I figured you'd want to decorate however you like and bring your own stuff type thing. We can go shopping and get school supplies and you can get whatever you want, really. Nikki took a breath and looked at my dad, Sean, and said quiet. So nervous. It's okay to be nervous, Nikki, the social worker said. I think that's to be expected. I bet Cedar is nervous too. She smiled over to me. She was nicer than she usually was, more polite. I could tell Nikki and Sean were not like the other parents in here, or even like the foster parents. They looked richer. Something in the way they sat there, the way Nikki looked uncomfortable, made everything around them look more poor. I don't know if they were rich or anything, really. It was only a feeling, a too-good-to-be-true kind of feeling, a too-good-to-be-trusted. Nikki said, we got everything ready we can, and Faith, my daughter, she's so excited to be meet you. She would have come too, really, really wanted to, but I didn't want to, you know, overwhelm you with all of us on the same day. She took my dad Sean's hand in hers. We wanted to have more, have a little brother or sister for you. But I've always wanted to meet you, Cedar. As soon as I heard, as soon as we all heard about everything, I just knew we had to get here somehow. Knew we were your real family. Her eyes filled with tears, she was afraid for her mascara, that her eyes would run dark and be ruined. Nikki kept talking, stopping only to awkwardly laugh. My daughter is also native, well, mixed, Métis, like you, I guess. And her dad is from Alberta. He's not um, 
around, but she's the spitting image of his mom. Thank God she doesn't look a thing like me. So I know, I know what it's like. And well, I married your dad, didn't I? We're a pretty, we're open and diverse, you know, we don't see color in our heads. The social worker leaned back and looked like her job was done and she could relax now. Sean too, my dad seemed like he usually just Nick, let Nikki do the talking. I wanted to tell her that's not what mixed means. It's not mixed, not like that. But I only looked at my dad, at Sean, but tried not to look like I was looking. Did he look like me? Or would it be, did I look like him? Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Thank you. Whew. I think that that's what I did after every chapter. Um. <laughs> God, this, I just uh, always like the heavy stuff. God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, I just want to remind everyone that's out there that is uh, watching. Um, can you please just re like remember, like while I'm. I, I, I'm going to be asking uh, Katerina some questions, but this is also a time for you uh, to ask her some questions. So if you're going to do this, just, okay, so if you look down below, no, don't do it. Don't put it in the chat. Put it in the Q&A section, okay, so that I can look at it and look at the, uh, the questions and, and we're going to try to get through as many as we can. But this is the time, get, you know, get the wheels turning. Um, this is your moment to be able uh, to ask questions. And at the same time, I want you to really think about like asking questions that are actually questions and also respectful questions would be really lovely. Okay. Because um, if it's not respectful, I'm not going to read it. Okay. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> I always like to set those boundaries. You know what I mean, right? These, these sometimes these events. Um, Light in our hard assness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you kill with kindness. Um, so, okay. The uh, usually, and we we both know as as authors that we get this question a lot. Like, what inspired you? What inspired you? And instead, I I, I want to ask you, what what drove you? to tell the story, what made you understand that the story had to be told? And I want to know about the moment you finally put pen to paper or rather fingers to keyboard. Tell me about that. Oh, I like that. Um, well, I wrote, wrote the break and, I, and the break um, a few years ago and the break really felt like the tip of the iceberg of this world I had created in my head. I had, you know, real, I really like genealogy. So I had genealogies and families all lined up and, and I knew where people lived on the grid uh, of the street grid. And um, when I came down to re write the break, it really felt very tip of the iceberg to everything I had created because it was one story in amongst um, many stories. So there was a lot that I didn't fit in that just didn't fit into that story. Um, and I just thought that was normal because it was my first time reading a no writing a novel and it was hard enough to write that novel. So I thought that was just normal and I was going to leave everything else behind, maybe pick it up in pieces or something. And then I was actually at a writer's festival and I remember this author, I don't remember who it was, but um, they just said something like, yeah, I wrote my novel and then my character is like left and I was done and away we go. And I just remember thinking, lucky bastard, because <laughs> I felt like <laughs> they weren't letting me go. They just kept like talking to me and I made up all these friends and they just kept going. Friends in quotation marks. Some of them are not my friends. Um, some of them have very complicated relationships with me. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> but I thought, oh, well, maybe there's something here. So I knew. I knew I wanted to continue with Phoenix's story. Phoenix is loud. She's a very loud character in my head and I think on the page. Um, and I knew exactly where she was going. I knew a little bit about Cedar and Elsie because um, actually one of, I had written um, the first chapter of Cedars, I had written as a short story many years ago. Um, so I really took them up and knew where I wanted them to go. And, and then Margaret too, again, force of nature, loud ass. <laughs> Sorry, I'm gonna be sweary. <laughs> Oh, um, this, these characters, I, I wanted to, and, and they kind of came together as this family. I really just talk, thought about this family and the family dynamics and how people, 
you know, go into and out of each other. I wanted to talk about estrangement and how sometimes we just do not need to talk to our families, but we're still, they're still in us and we're still all a part of each other. I really wanted to dive into, you know, those, those great Machif stories. I wanted to spend more time. I'm really into Machif kitchens, you know, with tea. All my stories have a, take place in a lot of kitchens with a lot of tea and supper cooking in the background while everyone's gossiping. Um, so I just wanted to be, be there and it really just, I think it was that writer's festival. I decided that I wanted to jump back in and, and see where it would go. <laughs> did it feel familiar? Like once you did jump back in, did it feel like as if you were, there was a reunion of sorts? It happened really fast. I write, um, because there's four different voices here. I wrote each of them in turn first. So I wrote Phoenix first and I really wrote, I wrote her first chapter over the course of, I think a day and I cried. It was, um, it never happens that fast for me. I tend to pluck over things and like piece things together and like end up being like this puzzle of mess for years. Right. But Phoenix really just came and I knew exactly how she was going to go. And then I wrote each one after that. So they weren't all fast like that, but Phoenix was a truck, a train truck train. She, she was barreling down the road anyway. <laughs> Why do you think that was, what, what do you think it was about Phoenix that it almost like, as if like, it was like a conjuring for you? I think Phoenix herself has always kind of been a conjuring for me, actually. I, I know Phoenix has been around, me for a really long time. I don't know who she is or where she came from. I can literally picture the first time I saw her image, um, where I was living. And I know that um, my, like my daughter who's 20 now was a baby. Um, and she just, I never knew how to tell her story, but she just kind of lingered there. Like this weird friend, friend in quotation marks, because I think that um, I wanted to tell her truthfully. I also wanted to tell her with compassionately and, and with as much love as she would let me cram in there. But it also took me a long time to write her. By the time I wrote the break, I hadn't written Phoenix. Um, she had been around me for, for 10 years and then it took me like another 10 years to write the break kind of thing. Um, so by the time she got started though, I think she just had a lot of story in her. And it was a very obvious moment too, like you know, story-wise, because he was about to give birth. You know, we left her at the, during the break, finding the break, <laughs> the story. Um, she was about to give birth and that just seemed like this perfect moment to start. And that actually became like a big theme throughout The Strangers, this idea of birth and choice of birth, um, choice of parenthood versus not choice that choice being taken away, the ability to parent being taken away, that became like this overwhelming theme. And it really just started with Phoenix and her demanding, raging voice as she was laboring. That that scene is, uh, yeah, it, it uh, I had to have a cup of tea after that, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, and if you can imagine, I was reading it in like, um, just like at dawn, uh, we had just moved into the house, so like no, no lights were put up yet, and it was just like just just like maybe like my my cell phone light, just reading it, going, <gasps> yeah, and just having enough electricity to have myself a cup of tea because I needed it. That that was so powerful, so powerful. Like tell, because of the fact that there, okay, so you're talking about genealogy and stuff like that. Like there is a literal family tree here in the beginning of the book. And yet you then go narratively, like you build this tree so that we understand the structure of it and also the gnarly ways that this, this tree is growing because of so many systems that are, are, are failing this family. Tell me about that. Tell me about this enormous task of mapping out this family and making sure that it was clear to the reader. Um, well, the making of the family wasn't difficult at all. I'm, I'm used to big families. I've always kind of, I come from two big families. My dad comes from a family of five. My mom comes from a family of nine. So, and I've always been obsessed with 
you know, genealogies and making them. I remember my first year in university, I did an anthropology project where I had to make this giant ant like family tree on both sides that kind of culminates into myself and I still have it. And because I loved that action of figuring out all of these things that make me, you know, who I am. Um, and I, so I love that. I, and so it wasn't difficult to create a family. I actually made this family, you know, comparatively smaller because there's only four children and, and it's really, um, and in that one generation, kind of the generation of Margaret that kind of builds into subsequent generations. So that part wasn't hard. Um, and I just, I, because each one of their narr their stories is essentially separate, you know, they're, they're defined not only by how they're connected, but also their incredible separateness throughout the book. So I wanted to make sure to give each one of them connections to that family. You know, so Elsie, as wandering as she is and as lost as she is, she still has her uncle Toby. You know, she still has that connection. And, you know, Cedar finds her dad, Sean, who becomes an intimate connection. He is a friend of the family, so he becomes an intimate connection. Um, Phoenix has, has been, who is not associated with the family, but um, she has connections to Cedar. And they all kind of weave in and tell stories of one another and to one another. So they kind of create the bigger fabric of the family. And I mean, that, of course, was we know from family stories that could go on and on and on into, you know, infinite, you know, all these like funny stories and not so funny stories that we tell over and over again. If we're lucky enough to hear over and over again until we're bored of them. Um, so that's when Margaret became really essential because Margaret was as much as her story is so lost to the um, the the other's narratives because of separation, because of system, systemic uh, intervention. Um, but also she was able to kind of make that connection to not only the her mother's generation, um, which the other younger ones don't have that connection, but the overall story of the, of, of the family. So she's able to give that foundation to them, which they don't really know you know, like Elsie and her girls, they're, they're not, they're separated from that. So they don't know all of that story, but it's still their foundation. It's still something that they have inside of them. So um, I just had so much fun with that because there's so many characters in the family that um, like her dad, Mac, and his, his silly stories and swear words, um, and her mom with all her sad stories and, and also swear words. Um, but yeah, I just, I had fun with the individual stories, right? And I wasn't worried about the whole because I was just picking little stories and stuff. And that's what, what made it fun. And all together they have the, they make the bigger story, but yeah. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Like, and, and tell me about the authenticity of voice given these, these beautiful perspectives and that, that make up the tapestry of this, of this novel, mm -hmm. uh, because each one seems to have, like, it, 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 it definitely feels like its own little spice cabinet. It has its own very specific palette. Um, so, t so tell me about that as an author, like making sure that that was really clear for the, for the reader. Um, I'm a little obsessed with voice and, and point of view. Um, point of view, I totally blame UBC on that. They kind of drilled the <laughs> point of view in, you know, it's like, you know, the amount of times you would, we would just go up oh, POV slip, POV slip. And, you know, your classmates would come at you with like, you know, axes, which are really just red pens, you know, which are <laughs> proverbial anyway. Um, but I, so I have point of view drilled into me and I, and, the, and most of my writing, most of my fiction, I used to always write in the first person and I'm really lavish myself with that luxury of being in the first person and just, you know, stuck in people's heads. Um, so going into a close third, I take myself out of the person's head, thank God, because no one wants to be in there. Um, and, and, but I still stay so close to characters and I love the idea of embodiment of a character and really just like, um, my cat really wants to be known today. Oh my gosh, um, no worries. No worries. I love interruptions. Seriously. She's going to come up anytime now. Um, <laughs> take it over the whole show. Um, 
so I really love that idea. Like I, I feel almost like an actor when I'm writing these characters because I'm all like I'm just obsessed with getting them right and getting their voices right and and having how they appear on the page, how their words appear on the page to be exact. So I, I wrote them all how I heard them. And then I went back as I folded the stories together, I, I noticed similarities and also crafted a lot of similarities between them. So in a lot of ways, Cedar becomes like Margaret, her grandmother, who she doesn't know, but they're both institutionally educated women, right? They talk very similar. They're both, you know, sharp as a tack, you know, they're sharp as tacks. Um, Elsie, who's more struggling, her sentences are more choppy. You know, her sentence, her, her narrative is a little more, um, shifting because she's literally shifting and twitching in her, in throughout her life, um, and Phoenix just God love her. She's you know her, she f bombs like punctuation. Um, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but that's to me is that is important for her voice. I know so many. I know so many young people, and I was definitely a young person who just, you know, you you use your cussing and your language, and you talk a completely different way than than other people. And to do her justice, I had to just let those fly. And I'm I'm a pretty sweary person to begin with, so I was not judging her. But she's angry, you know. And we meet her as she comes into the story, like her freight train. She is birthing a human being. You know, we, she is like, like, and all her anger and all her rage and all her fear is right at the forefront. And it kind of just continued like that. So I just kind of had to show that as much as possible because she was not pulling any punches. Well, she, well, she was punching. Yeah. I guess that's the term, right? Pulling punches means you're, yeah, she was not pulling punches. She was getting right in there. <laughs> I just had to get her. Yes. <laughs> It's so funny. It reminded me of, um, you know, in, in theater and for puppetry is that the main thing is to make the puppet breathe. You've got to breathe into it, whatever the object is that you are animating. And I found myself breathing the way your characters were breathing in every chapter. And uh, which made it a lot like it made it like this really like, like it was an in the body kind of experience reading, reading your book, which made it a both difficult and captivating at the same time um so thank you it's just it's it's oh, brilliant um so a sentence that is said over and over again in the book is i don't want to get your hopes up and i almost felt like as if you were saying that to us as audience members mm -hmm. i don't want to get your hopes up because hope is given and taken away hope is given and taken away and for someone like me um who's had uh, life experiences that are vastly different from the people in this novel is that um, I caught myself with my privilege being like, oh, I keep on oh. thinking that where you're going is you're going to a place where um, you're uh, sorry, can you hear me? Because uh, there was like a weird blip in the audio. You can hear me? Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah, it's rural internet, you know. Uh, so, um, with my privilege thinking that, oh, you know where Katarina's going, she's, what's going to happen is A, B, and C is going to happen. And then this family is just going to, boop, 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 everything's going to be fine. There's the, you know, uh, even like, you know, with the naming ceremony, everything, I was just like, that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a convergence of all of them there. Uh, one of them's going to suddenly like catch a, catch a plane and get the, uh, in my mind, I'm thinking this is what's going to happen, and like it just constantly how I'm constantly having to reconfigure what hope means. So, so tell me about that. Tell me about your the the use of hope in this novel. Um, um, that's interesting. That I, I I tend to repeat myself all the time, so I hope I didn't repeat it too often. No, but I loved it. I thought it was definitely intentional. <laughs> <laughs> um, my copy editor should have caught that. Um, <laughs> but I do think it's a term and it's something particularly through Cedar and Elsie. So Cedar is a, a child. She's under the age of 18 and she's trying to reconnect with her sister who is incarcerated and her mother who is, um, she's, ex no one really knows where she is. She's transient. Um, so 
so, and it's also Cedar trying to be a hardworking, non-white, non, a lot of things student. So she's trying to, she has aspirations for university. So it also comes up. I remember it very clearly in the, in the conversation she has with the guidance counselor about not getting her hopes up. You know, that's something I remember being told so many times in so many ways throughout my young life throughout my life, you know, it's this idea that you have to have the realistic expectations. You come from this and you can expect to go over here. You can't expect to go over here. Don't look at that. Like, you know, yeah. shoot, for, shoot for the stars. Sure. But you know what, you know, manage your expectations. You never know. Um, which I find incredibly, you know, perhaps it's realistic and perhaps it's correct, but it's also, you know, really, you know, really has a way of just cutting everything down. Um, but it's also something that I've heard so many times when you're dealing with the system. And in this case, it was the um, child welfare system. And it's also the youth detention system. It's this idea of don't get your hopes up. Because that's the other part that it it happens with, um, with Phoenix as she's trying to better herself while she's incarcerated. She's trying to better herself so that she can be there for her child who gets taken away from her right after he is born. Um, and she too is not supposed to get her hopes up. You know, it's always these ideas of managing the expectation because the system is always working to protect the system. You know, it's, it's in theory protecting the vulnerable, but it's also, you know, caging those vulnerable persons in hopefully protection, hopefully, but also in, in, you know, that you have to maintain your space. So as a young person under 18, you don't have a lot of agency in where you're going to go. As a young person who's incarcerated, of course you don't have an agency of where you're going to go. And as a mother who's had your children taken away from you, and despite your repeated attempts at coming back, there is only certain places you can go and you're very restricted. So in, in a sense, even though Phoenix is the only one in prison, they are all in a certain prison if I may, that might be um, a challenging thing to say and, and definitely not a complete thing to say because Cedar is, is a young girl who's growing up in a suburb and she has a lot of privileges and a lot of opportunity, but she's also kept from a lot of things, you know, and her mother is someone who's suffering from drug dependency, you know, which is its own cage of a different kind. You know, so no, they are not incarcerated and no, they are not in jail, but it's still, they're being kept in a lot of ways. So I think that's where that, that, you know, dying of hope or that, you know, shooting the arrow through the hope bubble and, and having it all crash down. Like, I feel, I feel that in so many different ways in, in my lifetime and in the lifetimes around me. Well, it looks like um people are have so much to ask you oh, yeah. yeah so i'm thinking it's just so that i know that they were telling me like around like 7 40 ish start at, like letting people um ask questions but i think now is probably a good time do you, do you feel good about that katarina i, I feel good I, towards that? yeah and i can also say i'm i'm pretty open to questions you know for those who are on the fence of whether or not to ask questions, I tend to answer anything. And if I don't answer anything, I'll just tell a story about something else. But. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> All right. So we have a question here. Um, when is the next book coming? Love, love, loved The Strangers. We're all in the same boat. Yeah. <laughs> love it. Um, thank you. Um, the next book is being drafted. It is coming out next fall, I think, 2023 for sure. Um, I don't think I'm going to be any sooner than the fall. <laughs> I, yeah, the, I, I slow, I slow rate right down, but it, it is coming. It is coming soon, sooner than later. Well, we can't wait. We can't wait to hear more about that. Um, uh, we have a question here. I have read the break and thoroughly enjoyed it. Are your books based on your life story or that of your family? Um, no, <laughs> my short answer. <laughs> um, I do take a lot from my life experience in a way and, and those around me, I do purposely fictionalize everything I write, um, in the way that I might, um, 
you know, certain characters might be reminiscent of certain people, certain situations might be reminiscent of something, but I purposely choose things that are not, um, I mean, sometimes there's parts of my story, but I, I purposely never take from anyone else's story and, and stories that do not belong to me, unless I have permission to do so. Um, but mostly I really try to stay in the fiction realm. I mean, inevitably as authors, and you know this, we end up always talking about ourselves anyway. Um, but I felt it was important to not only symbolically, as far as the situations go, particularly in the break, because there's very specific situations that revolve around another situation. And, and same too with the strangers. It's very much my family, but my family also wants everyone to know it is not my family. <laughs> and it's not, it's not, it's, it's, like there's echoes of my grandparents and my father in there. My aunties and cousins are all over there and in their ways, but it is fiction because I have very specific things that I'm talking about and I, and they don't belong to any one person. And it's interesting too, is that sometimes when you're writing fiction is that um, there, there are people that are in your, in your lives that, you know, the part of it is that if you write really well, people can see themselves in it. And sometimes like the horrible thing is that sometimes they think that it is about them. And it's like, no, yeah. it's, not. it's just, yeah, it's just that it's, it's, it happens to be that if we're doing our jobs well, it, it definitely feels real. So well, uh, there, oh, sorry, I, know, go on, I, just, go on. Well, I was thinking of a story um, in that actually there's a really, there, there's a depiction of um, what hap I, I won't reveal anything. I don't like to get into the heavy parts when I'm doing talking. Um, but I will say in the break for anyone who's familiar with it, there's a situation that happens with Elsie, which for me is it's an assault. Um, and for me was the um, was something I had heard of. And, and was real and I depicted as carefully as I could. Um, and numerous people not only from this city, but from other cities have asked me if I was depicting a situation that they were familiar with, which to me is tragic because it, because these stories are everywhere and these stories look the same and, and they're happening to so many people. So I thought it was something that was, you know, not unique. I knew it wasn't unique, but um, I didn't know it was as common as it was. You know, so I mean, it's definitely not something I took from any one particular situation. Um, but yeah, we, you know, this, what is it? The specific is the universal and the universal is the specific. I mean, when you talk about things, anything, yeah, you know, you want people to relate to it. And unfortunately, sometimes people really relate to it. I mean, unfortunately, fortunately. <laughs> yeah. Um... We have a, a question uh, here about because of the connection between the break and the strangers, uh, it will, uh, and will there be another book based on these same characters? <laughs> yes. Um, and yes, I'm answering questions so succinctly. Um, the next book is called The Circle, and it is um, intended, should end up being like this, it's, you know, um, it's an, it's kind of the characters from the break and the characters from the strangers together. Um, but not all the characters from the strangers and not all the characters from the break. Um, the starting point of the circle is when Phoenix is released from prison. And it's kind of the events that unfold after that. So there's a lot of connection. And if you, like the last chapter of the strangers really puts both of those worlds in, you know, clashing. I don't want to give anything away, but. I mean, they're, they are connected <laughs> and um, they are connected and it's a small world, small Winnipeg, as we say. Um, so they are, they do inter intertwine in, in both books, but also in the next book, it's kind of more of a crashing together. And which one was the hardest voice to write? Ooh, in this book, um, I think I would say Elsie. I mean, Phoenix is hard to hard to everything, but you know, but Elsie, it was. I was so frustrated with her, and there's something so lost about her, and and being in the midst of 
Um, she's in a heavy, heavy opioid addiction. Um, there's so much helplessness in there and learned helplessness. And also like, you know, she has so much has been taken away from her. Um, and I relate to her so much. I feel so similar to Elsie in so many ways. And I think I really had to confront that own, you know, those own times in my life when I was helpless and not acknowledging my own power. And that was really hard for me. The easiest was Margaret because Margaret's just curmudgeon and angry and that's just fun. Well, it's not always fun, but I mean, when she was just a purely grumpy old lady, I had good fun with her. Um, she takes it a step too far most of the time, but I really had fun with um, when she was just being a grumpy old lady. I'm getting to be a grumpy old lady. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like, like really embracing the, the grumpy old lady that I'm becoming. I'm like, yeah, I want to give unsolicited advice. I want to, <laughs> I, I want to be curmudgeonly. I mean, I, and you know what I think it is? I think it's just like a less of a filter. You know what I mean? Like, I don't care. And I, I'm now realizing why, you know, so it's great. Yeah. It's My great. thing right now is I have two older children who are 20 and 22 and I've completely lost my filter with them. I'm telling them shit about like they all the things I didn't tell them. I'm just like anyways, blah blah blah. blah. I'm like <laughs> and they're enjoying it or at least they're quiet and polite about it, but I'm enjoying it. It's great, you know. Yeah, the less us to give the better. <laughs> Um, we have a, a, a question here. Um, your characterization of all the women in the novel is so rich and nuanced. And sometimes I would reread parts simply to enjoy the description and dialogue once again. Um, given the age old stereotypes of, um, that often are associated with indigenous folks, uh, was it hard to also expose characters challenging traits as well? I know that other artists in the past, authors in the past Mordecai Richler, for example, were criticized by their own communities for further exposing the challenging aspects in each character because they sometimes potentially play into unfair stereotypes. So what are your thoughts about that? Um, well, stereotypes are bad. That's my first thought. Um, but perfect characters are boring. <laughs> That's my second thought with that. I, I don't think I do anybody any service by trying to I think it actually feeds into stereotypes when you try to make a per character perfect because God forbid someone from the outside world can see that a character, you know, I mean, we have this idea of um, modelness, you know, model minority, right? You know, you have to be this perfect person, you know, that we have to go through and have no faults and we don't get to be, um, you know, make mistakes. And that just takes away our humanity as much as any other kind of thing, any other kind of stereotype does. Um, the truth of these characters is that they have been imposed by overarching surveillance of the state for the entirety of their lives and the entirety of their grandparents' lives and the entirety of their grandparents' lives. The problems that they're facing and the issues they are presented with are not they're doing. They are, they, are, they are responses to the myriad attempts of genocide that have happened on Michif people and all other Indigenous people in, since contact. And I want to, I always get, I, I get a little huffy when I, when I start talking about this because I do not think Indigenous people have anything to be ashamed of. I think we are responding to attempts of genocide that and have been imposed upon us, whether it's through bureaucracy, whether it's through interventions into our parenting, whether it's interventions into our land sovereignty or any of the other things. Responding to that is a hu it, we're human. We get to have human responses. You know, Elsie is someone who was put on opioids to respond to a pain and she became addicted. That is not a Michif problem. That is not an indigenous problem. That is a human problem. That happens in communities all over the place um, because of a bunch of factors that, you know, 
have nothing to do with her. She is, you know, her parenting was interrupted by surveillance on the state because her family and her parenting was viewed with more scrutiny than someone who was completely equal to her situation who was non-Indigenous. That is a fact. She, her kids were taken away from her because of mistakes she made true, but that doesn't make her a horrible person and that doesn't make her mistakes any bigger than a whole bunch of other people. And that doesn't mean she didn't need help. And that doesn't mean she didn't need resources to access. But the response of the state is usually first and foremost to break up the family because it's cheaper to do so. And putting kids in foster care is cheaper than helping the families stay together. Um, that's my rant. Um, and I could go on, but I don't think, I think that showing people what I do whenever I sit down and write anyone is I want to write them authentically. And in order to write them authentically, I have to write them with strength and love and hope because those are the people I see. I see people, uh, those are the people I know and those are the people that are in my family and in my community. Many of us are struggling. Many of us are thriving. Many of us are doing amazing, wonderful things and, are, and some of us are up and down every day like me. Um, but it's, it's not, people get to be human and, and to not show people as human would be doing them a disservice. And to, I, I think each one of these women, each one of these men and these people in this book have something of value to give to the world. And I think we all have something of value to give to the world. And I think that people who might not look like your typical heroes and heroines also warrant literary attention. Um, so that's the people I want to write about. Um, if I get come at with pitchforks and stakes and run out of town, um, I know that my intention was always love. And, and I tried to do that as much as I was showing their pain, I was showing how strong they were. Okay. I'll stop. <laughs> no, no. Thank you so much for your generosity. Thank you. <laughs> Um, speaking of imperfections, you have a question here. I love this one um, uh, about uh, Cedar's father. Do you think that he regrets his absence from her life before she came to live with him? Because I do love that character, the imperfection of him. Yeah. John, I actually named him after my first crush. Um, and put <laughs> there you have it, Sean, wherever you are. So I'm going to find this Sean Dupree um, <laughs> out in elementary school in the 80s. Um, and I'm going to say, I named this guy after you. Um, no, Sean was absolutely. I think, I, I don't know Sean's motivations um, necessarily. I'm not in his head. Well, he's in his head a little bit. But um, I think he does. I think that there's a level of powerlessness that we have to understand in certain people in certain situations. Sometimes we are not aware of our own power. And I think when Sean made that choice, it was when he was newly out of prison and feeling very ashamed of himself. This is giving away the story. Um, but he was, um, he was vulnerable to an opinion that led him away from his kid, kids because Phoenix was definitely also his kid. Um, and I think that was definitely a choice that he regrets. I don't think that we always know how, much, how powerful we are. We don't always know how important we are. And I think sometimes we make ourselves absent in other people's lives because of our own shame and because of our own, we don't understand that we have value to their lives. And I think that's what Sean did. And I really applaud Nikki for all her faults. I love Nikki. I love um, <laughs> she really drew that out of him and she made that connection and, and for all her faults and she has many, um, I really love that she was able to do that. Cause I don't think that he knew he would have been able to do that without her. I think that he would have stayed in that shame cycle without her, but yeah, he is, um, he just really like stands up and, you know, brings it out. I love, you know, and, and it really becomes, um, when I write sometimes, most times, all the time, 
um, I surprise myself and when I put people together and just have them come out. And one of the most beautiful things I love in this book is um, Sean and Cedar in the rec room with the pizza, you know, watching action movies, which is something I did with my dad, still do with my dad. Um, and, uh, and really he just, you know, he not only gives her stories and connects her to her family and her past and him, but he also gives, she gives that back to him and he understands and learns how to be a father and learns how, how powerful he actually is and how important he is. So, yeah. Love that. I love that. Cause you know, parents are learning too. Parents are learning too. Yeah. Spoiler alert. Don't know it all. Don't exactly. tell exactly. I said that. <laughs> That's right. Um, I okay. I kind of really love this question because I, I, uh, I. It's so different for everybody. But can you, how do you choose the names of your characters? Is one of the questions we have here. I'm a total name nerd, so I'm gonna like I I I go off on names. Um, with this one, I had a lot of fun with. Um, French names to English names. You know, we had a lot of like, Margaret is actually the Anglophone version of her auntie who is Marguerite, you know, and that kind of signifies um, the Anglicizing of many, many, many people, but specifically Michif people here in Winnipeg. My family went through this. We have the generations and generations of French names going back you know, since we had French names, and then suddenly in the last two couple generations, you know, we have just English names everywhere, you know. Um, Elsie was named after um, her, her Mennonite great grandmother, which was the only name that Margaret knew. But because Margaret had so much shame of her own race, she named her daughter after you know, her white, after her white father's family. So forever Elsie has like not only an anglicized name, but a white name. You know, so it's like signifying Margaret's hopes for her. Um, Phoenix and Cedar Sage and Sparrow, which are Elsie's kids. Um, I just love those names. And Elsie is such a young mom, you know, so she, I think she picked such beautiful names for her kids and really just poured in so much imagination and, and love to her, her name. Cedar Sage is, is, well, two of the sacred medicines, you know, and it was kind of signified that time when Elsie was learning about her culture. Um, but Cedar Sage put together is just like medicine, medicine, powerful. <laughs> so I don't know why I really like them. Um, I could go on. I mean, in the break, I actually named a bunch of characters after street names in the North End. Um, I, I, I it's after um, Lorraine and Cheryl in the break are actually named after, um, there's a book called In Search of April Raintree. And that is was formidable for many, and formidable and seminal for many of us, but it was like, it created me as a writer. Um, and the sisters in In Search of April Raintree are Cheryl and April. And I changed those to Cheryl and, and Rain. Um, so still April Raintree, but just um, after Rain. So, and who else? Street names. Um, I like to go through and pick like lots of cool old Michif names. I make, I like to make sure I'm representing. Um, and in this book, I make a lot of, um, fun of all the Josephs because it's true in Michif families, we have lots and lots of Josephs because Joseph, St. Joseph is not only our patron saint, but everyone's named after their father. Who's also named Joseph after his father, who's named Joseph. So we have, we have lots of Josephs. So, and so in my books, I actually have like three main Joseph characters. I like to have fun with them. Yeah, I have tons of fun with names. But. <laughs> love it. No, I love it. No, I'm glad. It's, yeah. Cause like I, 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 because of the fact that uh, you, I, I always wondered how names were made up in, like for television shows and I just uh, finished uh, being in a television writer's room and I was realizing how random it was the way that we come up with names. Um, let's just say that uh, Terrence comes in and then he says to um, Lucy that like it was full on we were just making up random names um and so just 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 sometimes there's just no romance you your story sounds way better like your process sounds way better than ours 
Um, it for me. I want names. I want meanings. You know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like it would mean it means Delta John. Get yeah, like I don't know. It's it's, it's something. Yeah, no, it's nothing like that. Uh, we have a question here. Um, how much did the pandemic change your plans for the final section of The Strangers? And is the inclusion of the early pandemic ind indication that uh, when you were writing, you were writing in the now of the day time you're in? Um, yeah, it changed it completely. The first draft had none of the pandemic in there. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And then it wasn't going away. So like all of us, I like all of us, I was just kind of waiting it out and seeing like, how big of a deal is this? I did want it to keep it to kind of like, it's a year, it's five years, um, kind of connecting the break to, to the circle through the strangers, story. Um, so I did want to keep it in real time, um, without actually date stamping everything and, and text stamping everything, which sometimes can get really onerous and um too much um but i wrote rewrote year five and i wondered how it would change in the pandemic and it actually became you know there's so many symbols and, and kind of plays in this book about like that separation and about you know things that are keeping these people apart and the pandemic is is the perfect symbol for that because it literally puts barriers in front of us with other people. And it literally made everything 10 times harder. So if Elsie has been trying to see her, her kid, or rather Cedar's trying to see her mom and Phoenix is trying to get visitors to see her, but of course the pandemic puts that all on pause and everybody, ev everything becomes limited. And then suddenly everyone's who is gets, who did get to talk to one another it's through plexiglass and with masks on so it kind of became a part of like just another barrier that everyone had everyone in the book had to uh, kind of overcome and, and hurdle over um yeah i but i also think like we're, we're so pandemic out i wonder if i really this is this is my total aside i really wonder how art and is going and tv and and um, film, which is of course still art, but I wonder how much that is actually going to show the pandemic, you know, cause I think we're all like sick of the pandemic and whenever a show, TV show goes into the pandemic, I'm, I'm like, ah, no, I got enough of that in my real life. I don't need to deal with that in my entertainment. So I wonder how much we're actually gonna show it. Cause I think we're all just gonna skip right over it <laughs> in our imaginations as we all wish we would have. Um, you know, and then revisit it in 10 years when we romanticized, you know, something. But yeah, I totally skipped over it for the next book. I'm really hoping, unless something drastic changes, I just really wanted to like be post pandemic in, uh, in the circle because it was really hard. It's really hard writing about the pandemic. It's really, it really is gonna really a depressing time as far as human connection goes. <laughs> Yeah, I know it's like writing in the pandemic about the pandemic. It just seems a, a little, yeah, it's a little bit intense. Yeah, just, just a, it's just a little. Yeah, it's a, it's. I write fiction. I can skip right over that. <laughs> yeah, I can do what I want. I'm the writer. I can do what I want. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my god, Kendra, thank you so much for this amazing conversation. And thank you all for these wonderful questions. Yeah. I oh, wish that we could like sit here all day answering all of them, but because like I could listen to you all day, like your your process and everything. But then again, if we were to talk and talk and talk, it meant that it would mean that it would take forever for the next book to come out. So uh, <laughs> yeah, but thank you so much. And thank you so much for the, the Gillers for hosting us and allowing us to share space in this way. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone. And I just want to give a shout out to Canada Reads Contender over there and good luck. It's going to start up right away. Good luck. It's a great Oh my gosh, there, there's not enough wine. There's not enough wine to be able to listen to this conversation. Let's see. Let's see if I can make it. I just need a big, big uh, block of chocolate. So yeah, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Well, I too want to wish you so much luck, Catherine. Thank you. And Katerina, thank you. This was just an amazing evening. I loved hearing all about your process and your love of genealogy and your love of names and 
So um, thank you so much and thank all of you for joining us. It's always um, a pleasure to know that so many of you are asking questions and we have another wonderful uh, book club uh, lined up for April 4th when Eric Dupont will interview Kim Twee author of the novel M, which was also long listed for the 2021 Scotiabank Giller Prize. If you haven't registered for that, please visit our website. And of course, this interview, like all of our interviews, uh, both for our book clubs and our power panels, will be available on our YouTube channel. And um, thank you again so much. Have a wonderful night and a wonderful week.